So are we ready to spice it up? Yes, today that's what we're doing on these uh, end of days of the monsoon where the clouds are sort of being dreary and dull and not really raining and not really cooling things down and just waiting to be sort of swept off by the wind. The best thing to do is to spice it up. And uh, Indian food is all about spices. In fact, one of the essentials uh, of cooking is to understand the ingredients that you're using, the raw materials that you're using, whether it's vegetables or meats or pulses or grains or spices. So <clears throat> today we are talking about spices. Now, Indian spices are of course known globally. I mean, uh, right from the time when Vasco da Gama came in his pajama and went for a drama and discovered pepper on the coast of Malabar um, and then took it back to the west and then we had all these guys coming and spice, spice, give us spice, give us spice. So it all started and of course the fertile lands of our country was perfect for growing all sorts of spices and it still is. Um, India is probably one of the largest uh, growers of uh, things like cumin and pepper and uh, dhania and uh, which is coriander seeds and all sorts of things and of course turmeric. I remember there was a turmeric patent war at some time. I don't know if uh, somebody did pick up that patent or not. I didn't keep up with that news. But uh, turmeric does belong to India no matter what the world might say. And uh, <coughs> So our country with its vast geographical variety right from the coastal areas up to the hills, the mountains, the Himalayas, uh, north, south, the uh, rivers, the Gangetic Plains, the uh, other parts, the deserts, they all sort of you know uh, add to the growth of these spices and they sort of give us the perfect kind of temperatures and climates and uh, things like humidity and you have different kinds of soil and different kinds of waters to sort of you know grow these spices and get the best fragrances. Water is very 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 important. I remember when I moved from Calcutta to Delhi um, I found the vegetables and stuff quite tasteless because Calcutta everything is sweet. Uh, the water is so sweet, the fish is sweet, the the vegetables, the kaddu, the parmal, they all taste different including something like cucumber tastes so different in Calcutta. So next time you go to Bengal side you have to try the cucumber at least and you will know what I am talking about. So while moving from Calcutta to Delhi I found uh, things didn't taste quite the same but living there for a few years one sort of got used to things and then one moved to Bombay. and. It was disaster. All the food that I created in my kitchen just did not taste right, no matter what I tried to do. And uh, Amit, of course, was like, maybe, you know, your heart's not in it or whatever. I said, no, it can't be that. And then I realized there was some ingredient, uh, I don't remember which spice it was, but it smelled different. The fragrance was different. So the next trip that I went to Delhi on a holiday, I went and told my mother-in-law, Mama, I want spices, I want jeera, I want dhania, I want all these things. And we headed off to Chitranjan Park to pick up the Bengali spices, which was the mustards and the randhuni, and, uh, including the tezpatta, the bay leaves and the nigella seeds and stuff like that. And I came back to Bombay and uh, I cooked with those spices, which I had brought back. But somehow things were still not correct. And then I realized even when I was having something as simple as uh, you know rice with a little bit of ghee and uh, salt and green chili, um, even that did not taste correct. So then I realized it was probably the difference was the taste and the water of this place where I am now. And of course slowly we got used to it and now food tastes great. Uh, so it's all getting used to the water of the place that you live in. Um, every region has its different tasting water. So if you go south, it's different. If you go northeast, of course, it's different. And I'm sure in places like Ladakh and Leh, it must be totally different because, uh, for instance, when we'd gone to Uttarakhand, 
uh, everything tasted so great, so fresh. So, I mean, even the fish and the chicken was so, so tasty, I can't tell you. Because again, the water and the soil, everything is full of minerals and that is what they are all growing on. And if you've seen uh, Amit's uh, uh, video on why he's fat, uh, you realize that the plants sort of, you know, stay in the soil and don't move around. So that soil and the water that's going into them is very important and that is what is giving you the fragrance in the spice. So, which is why things like Kashmiri mirch, uh, saffron from that side, mustards from Bengal, um, jeera from, uh, I think the, I, I don't know exactly where jeera comes from, but chilies from various different parts of the country, they all sort of give you different flavors, different things that, you know, uh, meld with each other, react with each other, and then they sort of, so, Spices are not just about taste and flavor and uh, color. Spices also have, the Indian spices especially, also have a lot of medicinal values, a lot of healing power. Uh, a lot of them are antioxidants and things like that. And uh, this is something that has been propagated right from the Vedic times. It's all there in the Ayurvedas if you have uh, the patience and the Sanskrit to sort of read it for yourself. And of course, by what were our uh, ancient doctors, the Veds. Uh, my mother was, her uh, antecedents was Ved, Buddhi as they call them in Bengal. So she believed she was a doctor even though she hadn't studied it. But uh, she did have a lot of healing powers. And of course, all the stories that our grandmother told us. And uh, my grandmothers were great. I mean. For instance, my uh, paternal grandmother, she always had a bottle of uh, what she called bhaja moshla, uh, which was coriander seeds and uh, fennel seeds, soft, sort of roasted together. And uh, she would add a little bit of sugar in it, maybe, maybe not. And that would be there. And after every meal, we would all sort of chomp on it. For us, it was, you know, more like a uh, a taste uh, of mouth freshener, but it actually had uh, digestive properties. So the, the spices that we consume, they have a lot of medicinal and healing uh, uh, properties within them. And it's good to be aware of it because it's also good to be aware of what not to do in excess and what sort of to, you know, uh, use in various situations where you might have a tummy upset, you might have a headache, you might have a this, that, whatever. So what are the kind of things you can concoct in your own home to sort of alleviate your uh, symptoms or whatever it is? Of course, it helps to have somebody with medical knowledge to also advise you and guide you. So don't take things, uh, you know, don't go on your own uh, and do things. Always find out first whether it works or doesn't work and whether it's good for you or the side effects and things like that. Take turmeric, for instance, that beautiful bright yellow powder that sort of, you know, you, you put a pinch off in every, almost every curry that you make right from your dals to uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the various other <coughs> dishes that you make. <coughs> turmeric actually has, uh, no, I'm trying. Turmeric actually does have a taste and uh, we often don't realize it because we use just a pinch of it. But uh, if you sort of, you know, take a little bit of turmeric and taste it, you'll find it's got a, it's slightly bitter. Um, but it's also got a woody, mustardy kind of uh, feel to it. And uh, <coughs> its main ingredient, of course, is something called curcumin. This I find found out because uh, when that, you know, COVID disaster thing was happening and everybody was saying that, oh, have haldi, have haldi, it will take care of everything. So I sort of just read up on it. And... Uh, what I read was that there is this thing called curcumin, which is the most active ingredient in turmeric. But that curcumin, while it does have uh, very strong antioxidants and uh, very strong uh, anti-inflammatory uh, things, properties, it is also not, it is also like a blood thinner. So if you've got somebody who's on blood thinners and things like that, then too much of haldi is not good, which is why uh, during those disaster days last two years, three years, 
ago, if you remember, there were actually doctors coming across saying that, please, you know, don't have so much of turmeric. It's not good for you. It's not good for you. So I think the best way to consume turmeric is to use it the way we have been taught, the way our grandmothers used it, the way our mothers used it. Uh, just a pinch in your foods, use it in pickles, use it to marinate uh, vegetables because uh, it's like a preservative. Also use it to marinate your meats and fishes. Um, I think it has antibacterial properties as well because uh, if you have a cut or something, applying a little bit of turmeric paste is very good. Then of course, um, you can sort of, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> have it as they have something called dood haldi dood or something like that. I don't know. I've never tried it, but uh, I really don't know how good that is or what somehow the thought of haldi in my milk is a no-no. I'm not a great milk drinker, so I really wouldn't be able to talk about that. But haldi, uh, you get it in various forms. You get the dry powder, of course. You get the dry, uh, what are they, rhizomes? The, the dry roots or whatever, you get that dry as well so you can grind it in your own home and be sure that there are no uh, uh, you know other things being added, no additives, no uh, and you can also buy it in the raw form which is kacha haldi and uh, kacha haldi is great fun because uh, you really get the fragrance of the haldi in that and you can slice it up and just add it to a few of your dishes so that it's not too yellow, the fragrance is there um, uh, uh, things like, you know, fish curries and uh, things like avial and all that. I mean, you add a little bit of raw haldi in it like you would add ginger and uh, it, it changes the complexion of things totally. And of course, uh, in Bengal, kacha haldi is ground and uh, one day before you get married, you are sort of... Uh, you know, bathed in that kacha haldi, it's supposed to bring a glow to your face and make you look more beautiful and things like that. Um, I don't know if it really works. I remember being yellow for a day, but uh, that was probably the glow that people saw. But uh, that is a custom that is there and it's a great fun custom that uh, is followed in Bengal. So, Say hi, to Ash. hi Ash, you're early today. You're actually there within the first 10 minutes. Good to see you. So, <coughs> haldi is one essential that needs to be there, turmeric, in your kitchen for any kind of Indian cooking. The second one is the mirchi, haldi mirchi, mirchi red chili. Uh, red chili, of course, in powder form or red chili in the whole form or red chili even in the raw form. And um, even though chili, mind you, is not uh, native to India. Chili, I think, was brought in by the Portuguese. Uh, like the tomato, chilies also came from there. And But it has sort of, uh, you know, found its comfort zone totally in India. And it's very difficult to think of any Indian food, uh, any part of the country, without chilies in it. So whether it's green chilies or red chilies or, like I said, powdered chilies or whole chilies, uh, chilies are like uh, one of the main key ingredients in any kind of Indian cooking. And uh, when somebody says, oh, I don't eat chilies, you sort of look at them like, are you okay? Are you an Indian? Uh, you know, like, uh, should we sort of, you know, check your antecedents or what is it? But uh, <coughs> chilies, of course, uh, do various things. Again, they have huge medicinal properties as well. And that is something I found out when my mother was uh, unwell with, uh, I think she had colitis or something like that, tummy issues. And I saw her eating green chilies. So I said, you've got tummy issues, why are you eating green chilies? So she said, no, green chilies are actually good for the stomach because they have uh, something called capsaicin or capsicin or some, something like that, which is actually uh, heals the stomach or whatever. And it's a major source of vitamins. And of course, red chilies are a major source of vitamin C. So uh, I don't know why they didn't uh, propagate the use of red chilies like they did haldi <coughs> during the COVID times. But uh, anyway, so in chilies, of course, you have uh, 
currently I get my red chilies all the way from Bengal because there is this place in Bengal called Midnipur and I find the chilies that grow over there are the most tasty and they are hot as well and just the right kind of hotness so that it is not overbearing like a bhut jalokia or uh, the bird's eye but uh, it has got just the right kind of hotness and it has got just the right flavours to make your dish that much better. So if you are looking for good red chilies, get on to Amazon and look for chilies from red chilies from Bengal and if it is from Midnipur you will know it is good. Then of course you have like I said the bhut jalokia. Uh, I in my whole life I have bought three bhut jalokias, exactly three. This was in Bangalore at one of those uh, Christmas fairs that we had gone to and it was a northeastern fair and there was this lady who had come all the way from I think she had come from Shillong and she had this whole basket full of bhut chalokyas and I sort of looked at it and I was like scared. So she said okay you are scared so just take you know these three. I do not think I paid for it actually. So she gave me three chilies and uh, I still have some lying with me. She said just use a little bit. So she said like cut a strip off and use that strip to flavour your dish. Uh, of course we were talking about northeastern dishes which are more like stews and uh, they are mostly boiled or roasted. So she said just add a strip to your stew and it will taste amazing and it really does. So uh, I have that lying with me and uh, I am thinking of getting some more but uh, I will need to be brave enough because Amit loves his chilies. I mean give him chilies and he is like that Mark Queens guy. Have you guys seen him on uh, YouTube? I mean that guy is like popping whole whole chilies into his mouth and then sweating over there in front of the camera. So Amit is a bit like that. You show him chilies and he is like I want. So I have to be careful about the kind of chilies I store in my house. And then of course you have those bad guys. Bad guys I discovered when I was again in the south and they are these wrinkly kind of chilies which are uh, not so hot but they have amazing yes, flavour. Sandhya Yadav, hello I love your channel I have tried quite a few of your recipes thank you. Hi Sandhya good to have you here and good to know that you have been watching our channel. Um, it is it, do let us know how your how the recipes work out for you and if you are making any changes or you are making you know any adjustments or adapting things or whatever do let us know so that we can try out your versions of it as well. So going back to chilies of course there is the famous Kashmiri Mitch which is all fragrance and colour and uh, every recipe almost tells you to either add Kashmiri Mitch in the, uh, the masala the gravy or you add it as a part of the tempering at the end you know in a little bit of ghee a pinch of uh, Kashmiri mirch uh, does wonders to your dish. I mean the most uh, insipid looking dal can change colour and flavour and everything with that pinch of uh, Kashmiri mirch. And uh, then you have these uh, those fat chilies. I do not know what they are called. Uh, Gunda or Munda or something like that in Tamil Nadu and uh, we had gone to Chetanad uh, and uh, we went of course to the local markets and there were these guys selling these red dark red fat fat chilies and they were irresistible to buy so of course I bought a whole lot of them and uh, but hardly used any and uh, sadly they spoiled so maybe I will get some more and actually do something with them but they are really good. And they are essential if you are cooking Chetanad food because they have that particular pungency and that particular flavour that you get from that authentic Chetanad food. So if you are wanting to try making chicken Chetanad or mutton Chetanad or fish Chetanad or any of those things even the rasams uh, that they make over there uh, you have to get hold of those chilies. They are small and fat and uh, really cute if you can call a chilli cute. And then of course you have the Manipuri bird's eye chilies, uh, Manipur, Mizoram, wherever that side of it and those are, I have actually grown some bird's eye chilies in my pot and they grow very easily, they grow really fast and uh, they are quite pungent but uh, they are amazing and you can sort of you know uh, store them, you can add a little vinegar and uh, salt and sugar and preserve them and they look so pretty 
and you can sort of you know serve them uh, on your table for guests along with meals that might be bland because there are some people who can't eat hot food and there are some people who really love hot food so if you have a small you know glass bowl with these bird's eye chilies uh, it sort of does wonders for your table and uh, of course andhra pradesh has its own uh, variety of chilies which is i think it's called sanam or something like that and again andhra food you cannot think of without it you know sort of making you sweat making your head sweat because it is so hot and uh, there's this place in delhi that amit and i used to frequent i'm sure they have it uh, in every major metro uh, called andhra bhavan and andhra bhavan is like uh, it's part of the hostel for the the andhra government uh, officials but uh, they also have a section which is open to the public and we used to go there to eat every time we were like extra hungry especially in winter because you can only eat that kind of food in winter and uh, the service that you get in andhra bhavan it's like you you know it's like your uh, barati uh, you know the groom side at a wedding at an indian wedding and you're like welcomed and you're seated over there and you know there's this one guy who's like the uh, the mc or the the conductor of all the services that are going on and he stands in front of you and he calls those other guys come here and you know like serve the rice and serve this and of course thak 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 all those little bowls of various curries and sambar and rasam and uh yogurt and payasam and all that sort of come and then you order specially some chicken and you order specially some fish and uh, on the table there are these little uh bowls one has the gungura pickle or avakai depending on the season and of course you have the chili powder and you have the ghee and uh, it is it is absolutely amazing if you if you're in a town which has an andhra bhavan you must go and try out their food they're fed so good and uh, in the south of course all those podis which take in chilies uh, they are so yummy and they go with everything you can sort of sprinkle that podi on uh, a nice crisp toast with butter and just sprinkle that podi on it and you've got the most flavorful toast imaginable under the sun similarly in maharashtra also you have all these uh, meat masalas like the kola puri meat masala and the Uh, she saying it's called guntur chili guntur chili yeah okay the the little red ones huh so and you have these uh, uh the the red masalas in bombay which is for fish and for chicken and uh, it's specially made um at most homes and especially in the villages of course and uh, the lady who used to work for me earlier she vishakha she was going on a holiday to her home and she was like didi what can i bring back for you so i said if you can get your mother to make that you know that masala that red masala i would love it she of course came back with like a whole bag full there must have been a kilo of it and uh, chili is one of the main ingredients in that i never asked her what chili they use but it is so flavorful and you just need to add one tablespoon to anything you're cooking of course it's got coconut and uh, all sorts of other spices as well but it is an amazing thing so and uh, our dear friend yashu who keeps commenting on the slow fire chef channel yashodra uh, she's sent us these big jars of uh, all these Mar- maharashtrian uh, fish masala and mutton whatever chicken kola puri masala and then the red chili itself and uh, that's there i've kept them in my freezer because we use it uh, sparingly but uh, again you just need to add a spoonful of that to your fish and fry it and you've got an amazing uh, sort of dish happening there um chilies like i said have healing powers as well but uh, again uh, how much and what and all that is for specialists um i don't know if we have those kind of specialists uh, there in our country right now there used to be at one time when the ayurvedic ayurvedic uh, things were taught uh, seriously and in you know more prolific ways but uh, i mean it's best to be uh, you know follow our ancestors and best to be uh, you know use it in moderation whatever it is that you're using um there is something called degi mirch as well 
Degi milch is basically a powder which is uh, uses. Wow. Hi, Choiti. After a long time, two weeks, three weeks, and the middle wee one there as well. Good to see you. So, Degi mirch is actually a mix of red bell pepper and Kashmiri mirch. So, it does not have heat, but it is got beautiful color. And uh, if you do not, I mean, a lot of recipes ask for Degi mirch. But if you do not have Degi mirch, then uh, you can just use Kashmiri mirch uh, and I think that should be right. Uh, though next time, I'm, what I am going to try is I am going to roast that red bell pepper and then I am going to puree it and then I am going to use it in my Indian curries and see what happens because I know roast bell pepper makes lovely soup. If you have not had it, you must try it. Uh, pair it with tomatoes and uh, it's it's amazing soup so roast bell pepper is something that is worth trying um this episode would be very very long if i went into all the uh, spices that are essential to indian cooking so we're just going to be doing the first few that sort of come into my mind so haldi mirchi of course are essential Thank you. Thank you, Chaiti. So, <coughs> uh, haldi, namak, uh, haldi uh, mirchi, of course, are essentials that are always there in your little masala uh, dibba, or if you have one, or in the bottles, if that is what you are using. Then there is jeera. Jeera is so commonly used, uh, especially in the north of India. I mean, ask anybody any recipe. Ye kaise bana? Jira chonk do, jira chonk do, jira chonk do. And uh, whether you are making bhindi, you are making gobi, you are making any vegetable you are making, aloo jira of course is the most common. So, heat a little oil, temper it with jira and uh, if you are adding other, other stuff as well, then you add that other stuff. But jira is like a permanent chonk in the north of India. And uh, jeera is used in Bengal as well, but uh, not as commonly. It is used more in the powder form. Um, in the south, jeera, I do not know how common jeera is. I think it is used as a combo for with other, other masalas, but by itself, jeera is not so, uh, at least in the recipes that I have tried, jeera is not so common. But uh, in Rajasthan and uh, probably Gujarat, it is used a lot in your chaat masalas which is like bhuna jeera. So, you sort of dry roast it and then grind it and uh, jeera again medicinal properties yep uh, and jeera actually this I learned from a Chinese friend of mine and uh, she was getting a lot of flatulence and she came to me and she said hey Samanti can you give me some jeera. So, I said jeera. So, she was like yeah. I said, why do you, do you want jeera? You want ajwain? She said, no, no, jeera. Jeera is very good for flatulence. So, I gave her a teaspoonful of jeera and she just sat and munched on it and then swallowed some water after that. And uh, within half an hour, she was fine. So, I was like, it worked? She was like, yeah, it always works. So, now when Amit and I have overeaten or are feeling uncomfortable, we have a little chew up a little jeera. With Amit, of course, it is am oot ke mu me jeera. If you understand Hindi and you understand that, uh, doesn't really fit in. But oot ke mume jira, that's a nice uh, saying. Um, so jira is used in so many ways. I mean, the bhuna jira is is an essential in your chaat masala. In Bengal, you actually have dishes which only use jira in the uh, powder form. And uh, of course, in the old days, one didn't have ready-made jeera powder. So, you soaked it and then you know somebody sat and uh, ground it on the stone with the uh, mortar pestle or whatever it is. Uh, or then you roasted it and then ground it and uh, that, that roasted jeera fragrance is so refreshing and again it does wonders to your dish and by itself jeera is really flavorful. And the funniest thing about jeera that I discovered is uh, I was watching one of these YouTube things uh, because Amit wants to make sausages. He is very soon going to start making sausages. He has already done a mix for Italian sausage. He is just waiting for some uh, skin to put it into. 
but uh, when I was watching some of these videos on sausages, uh, there was this guy who was doing German sausages and all sorts of different sausages and they were using roasted dhania and roasted jeera and grinding it and adding it in, into their sausage. They use fennel soft in their sausage. In fact, that's what's there in Amit's uh, Italian. Oops, sorry, did I give away our recipe secret? Okay, so uh, I told Amit, well, you know, that's the Bengali influence on the world because they're roasting everything and they're using bhaja mashla to make sausages even. So uh, anyway, jeera is uh, again, it's, a, it's an essential ingredient when you're making chili con carne, for instance. Um, apart from the bay leaf and the uh, fancy western herbs, you have to use jeera to get, get that right flavor in your chili con carne. So remember that when you're making chili next. And uh, of course, jeera powder is used in various foods, in meats and chickens. Jeera powder is like an essential that's always there. And of course, what goes with jeera is dhania. Dhania is uh, like, you know, dhania jeera, they're like the, the twins, the, the star twins of the Indian uh, spice rack. And if you have dhania, you have to have jeera. If you have jeera, you have to have dhania. Can't, one can't do without the other. And uh, dhania is, uh, of course, you have it in herb form and you also have it in spice form. The herb is very lovely, fresh. And uh, again, the herb is used extensively in North India. Almost every dish in the North of India is garnished with dhania patti. If you're trying to, you know, make things look good because of that beautiful bright green color, you just sprinkle a little dhania leaves on it. In Bengal, especially in Calcutta, I used to find that dhania was not so common. Like in Delhi, if you go shopping for vegetables, the vegetable guy actually gives you a bunch of coriander and a few green chilies uh, for free. Okay, it's like pow, they call it pow. They actually put it into your bag without you even asking. And, uh, but in Calcutta, when you say that, you know, when you go and buy vegetables and you keep waiting, like, where's my dhania and uh, green chili coming? They sort of look at you like, are you crazy? You pay for it, pal. So you have to buy it in Calcutta. And it's the same thing in Bombay. Bombay, only the North Indian vegetable guys, when they recognize that you are also uh, from North India, they give it to you for free. Otherwise, you buy over here what they call masala. So in Bombay, you tell the vegetable man, thoda masala de do. And that masala is what? It's a little bit of uh, coriander leaves, it's green chilies, it's ginger, and it's uh, probably a few curry leaves in there as well. So that is the masala. But uh, the dried coriander, the coriander seeds, which live in your spice rack, they have such an amazing flavor. And uh, something I realized about coriander is that it actually adds a hint of sourness to your food. So if you chew the coriander seed by itself, of course, it's very refreshing and uh, you can actually taste all the flavors. But if you add coriander powder to uh, say that's probably why it's added to things like pickles and uh, uh, you know, gobi ka sabzi and things like that, because it adds a hint of sourness. It's not overpoweringly sour that you can actually taste the sourness, but it's got that lemony kind of a feel to it, that flavor to it. So the undertones are kind of like that. Do I sound like a French perfume guy? <laughs> um, dhania is again coriander rather is again a foreigner in our country but it's hard to imagine it came all the way from Italy but it's really hard to imagine because uh, Indian food without dhania powder in it is like or pisahua dhania in it or dhania leaves in it or dhania ki chutney uh, dhania pudina ki chutney is unimaginable today but it's obviously happened a long, long time ago, somewhere in the 15th, 16th century or whatever. And uh, therefore, we are sort of, you know, reaping that. And uh, today, India is probably one of the largest growers of coriander again. And earlier, in, in fact, uh, when we were younger, coriander, the fresh coriander, the herb coriander, used to only happen in uh, winter. Now, of course, you get it right through the year. 
and uh, I don't know whether that's thanks to that GM stuff or whether it's thanks to transport being more easily available, transportation being more easily available. But whatever it is, uh, coriander is there now all through the year. So we have mitchi, haldi, dhanya, jeera. Okay, the combination of this along with salt and ginger is something that sort of goes into <clears throat> almost every Indian curry as they call it. Um, whether it's north, south, east, west, uh, these are things that sort of go into your curry, whether it's vegetarian, whether it's non-vegetarian, almost all curries have this. And uh, something else that I find fascinating, of course, uh, it's mostly uh, something that you find in Bengal and Orissa, not so much in the other states, maybe a little bit of Assam, is mustard. Mustard is so, uh, what should I say, dynamic because mustard has so many different ways of getting used and you, of course you have the black mustard and you have the white or yellow mustard and you have the brown mustard, the small little seeds which, we, which is actually what is called rai. The other seeds are sarso and the small ones, the teeny weeny ones, that is called rai. So, Mustard is like, I mean, South India of course tempers everything with mustard, almost, or is it everything? If you are a South Indian watching this, please correct me. But uh, almost everything that I have had from South India has that tempering of mustard, right from pachri to samba, rasam to everything under the sun. And somehow without that kari patta and mustard chonk, uh, you just need to add that kari patta and mustard chonk and you have got South Indian food happening. Just do that to boiled potatoes with a little onion and salt and, and uh, turmeric maybe and you have got like a South Indian palya curry or whatever that is called uh, happening on your table. Um, or you know, do it to your rice and you have got a South Indian, add a little lemon juice and you have got a South Indian uh, lemon rice happening. And in the north, they are more I think they use more of rai than they use of sarso. But uh, I was quite surprised to find that uh, Punjab actually uses a lot of mustard oil. And uh, I would actually put mustard oil and even til oil in the spice rack because they add so much flavor to the food. Um, gingerly oil or til oil as it is called, I mean you make a pickle with that and it's got a whole different taste. Uh, same thing with coconut oil. Um, I had a friend who was from Assam and she would made this salad, invited us for dinner one night and she would made this salad and she had used mustard oil to sort of do her dressing for the salad and I can't tell you how amazing it was, just two teaspoons of uh, you know mustard oil with a little, little bit of lemon and uh, I think she would used a little garlic and you know shake it up with a little salt and sugar and spread that over your uh, greens and you have an amazing salad which is uh, so fancy tasting because it's got the hint of mustard in it without the mustard actually being there and uh, so you must try that. And of course the mustard seeds, um, Bengal of course batos it, shoshe bata, everything is shoshe bata. You can have shoshe bata fish, you can have shoshe bata deem, you can have uh, eggs you can have shoshibata in a plethora of vegetables right from bengan to uh, the stalks of the spinach or uh, the stalks of the cauliflower or just potatoes. Uh, you have that mustard sauce which is called kashundi which is used uh, as a condiment on the table and you can have am kashundi which is made with raw mango and kashundi mustard which is totally delicious. If you haven't tried it, get hold of it. I think they have it on that uh, Bisho Bongo website online. It's available online on Amazon. So, Am Kashundi is uh, really yummy, but buy it in summer when it's in season because that's when you know that you're getting a fresh uh, lot of Am Kashundi being made. And uh, of course, the mustard paste, making that paste is a huge, huge uh, 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 what should I say challenge because you have to do it just right. It can't be bitter 
and you have to get the water quantity right because it has to be like a thick paste, uh, it has to be really fine to get the best uh, taste out of it and uh, it is almost, uh, I think the French uh, probably learnt it from the Bengalis and the uh, Ahomias and the uh, Oriyas how to make mustard and how to use mustard in their various uh, meats and fish uh, because mustard making is such a delicate precise art, mustard paste making and a lot of times when I made the mustard paste to cook my fish with, uh, I have always put like a bottle away and added a touch of honey to it and maybe a little extra salt and I have served it to Amit as uh, French mustard and he's happily eaten it and loved it in fact. So you can try making that. So you need a mix of black mustard seeds and yellow mustard seeds in equal proportion and uh, you need to add a little salt to it, you need to add a green chili to it and then uh, you can either use the stone uh, mortar pestle to grind it but that is tough because you have to do it in one, uh, what should I say, it is called ak bata in Bengali which is like in one go you have to do it. You cannot like do it and then pull it towards yourself and do it again and then do it again and do it again because then that goes bitter. So it is best to do it in the uh, mixie, the grinder and uh, just you know run it at high speed with a little water in there and uh, it is it's a great way of making your food taste better and sort of you know pepping up the vegetables or pepping up the boiled eggs or pepping up uh, anything that you are eating. Um, in fact mustard has uh, is very popular in the holy books for some reason. I mean you have Jesus Christ referring to mustard, you have the Quran reference to mustard, you have Buddha talking I think about mustard and uh, probably because of its size and whatever mustard is very popular as, uh, as an example for various things. So <clears throat> the rye of course is used, uh, oh one thing I learnt about the black mustard and I learnt it this last year from this. A uh, Malayali friend of mine, uh, when she was teaching me how to make pickle, uh, she actually roasts the black mustard seeds and uh, then she dry grinds it. And I was like a little iffy about it. Being a Bengali, <coughs> it is very difficult to imagine dry grinding uh, mustard, especially the black mustard. So I called her up and I, you know, just before I was making it, and I was like, are you, bachi, are you sure that I am supposed to dry grind it and not make a paste? She said no, 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 no paste, just dry grind it, roast it and dry grind it and add it to your uh, meat, it will taste wonderful. So I followed her uh, and it really does work wonders for that pickle. Uh, this is that Malabar style of pickle and uh, if you want you can, I think it is there on the YouTube channel on Slow Fire Chef how to make the Malabar pickle. It is an amazing recipe and it works every time. I just follow Bachi's uh, thing blindly and it just works every time including adding that tomato in there which also I was a little doubtful about but uh, once I did I realized it really works wonders for that pickle. So you can do it with chicken, you can do it with meat, mutton, you can do it with uh, uh, prawns, you can do it with beef, you can do it with any of these meats. Um, so try it. And then of course uh, mustard is used, uh, rye rather is used in all sorts of temperings even in the north of India whether it is for dals, whether it is for uh, various other things. So, <coughs> okay. so mustard is a, a great and not to forget the mustard leaves which is not a herb, it is more like a vegetable, sarsoda sag and uh, in the northeast, northeast you have also sarsoda sag but it is called lice sag over there and it is a slightly different variety from the sarsoka sag that you get in North India. It is a more uh, delicate variety and that is used hugely in cooking uh, meat and fish and pork and all sorts of things. And it is one of the, I mean I have completely converted to using 
lychak in my non-vegetarian food because it adds such an amazing flavor and it's got that uh, property which sort of you know uh, kills the fat of the pork or whatever it is and just makes it that much more edible and that much more yummy so and once you sort of get it hang of it get the taste of it you can't imagine eating it's it's like i'm sitting over here and thinking about it and telling you about it and i really really want to eat it and i can't wait for winter to get a load of lysak into my kitchen i have even done it with uh, the north indian sarsoda sag you take the more tender leaves and use it um, of course every year we have to have sarsoka sag once at least uh, made in our home and again uh, it sounds you know most people make it like aaj kya ho raha hai khane mein kya aaj saag ban raha hai it's like a huge production saag ban raha hai but i don't understand why especially in this day and age where the pressure cooker is there you just pop it in with uh, you know a little bit of spinach a little bit of uh, bathua and uh, or you can use turnip if it's you know winter turnips are available and uh, give it a couple of whistles and your saag is done and then you can sort of you know mix it you can either use your mixer to uh, puree it or what i do is i just do it in the pressure cooker itself so it's not puree puree like that but it's like uh, mashed up and that really adds to the taste and then you just uh, you know temper it with uh, whatever you want whether it's garlic or onions or uh, lots of butter of course or ghee rather ghee and uh, it's yummy sarsoda saag happens at least once in our house and uh, you need to cook it in a nice quantity because you know doing this much doesn't make sense so invariably some of it goes into the freezer as well and is used later on or i take out half of it before uh, making the saag you know in its north indian form and preserve it for my pork curries or my fish curries or whatever so mustard is again a very very uh, i don't know where mustard came from i think mustard is probably inherent to india uh, mustard has been there for a long long time and it's uh, i think it's got mentions in the vedas as well so the other the last one that i'm going to talk about today is methi methi or fenugreek is uh, again very very high medicinal properties for things like diabetes and all that uh, that is what one reads about nowadays you sort of you know soak it overnight and drink the water the next morning and it's supposed to be very good for health i had a <coughs> the research says the yellow white mustard is indigenous to southern europe whereas brown mustard is from china and it was introduced to northern northern india Can you speak a little louder so that others can hear you? I just googled it. Okay, you googled said, it. Okay. It says the yellow and white mustard is indigenous to southern Europe. Southern Europe. The yellow and white mustard. Yeah, that's your French mustard and your your Dijon mustard and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> But we're talking about the Indian mustard. So so the last one last thing I'm going to talk about today is methi or fenugreek. um uh, methi is uh, i remember when i was a kid i used to actually sit and pick out the methi seeds from my food because uh, methi was very popularly used in uh, my home my mother uh, because i think that was the northeast influence from my paternal grandmother because uh, somehow in uh, the northeast food that the agartala food that they made Uh, almost everything had a little bit of methi in it so if it was a fish curry it was tempered with methi dal was tempered with methi uh, a tomato dish that was tempered with methi all sorts of things and uh, that tomato methi and lassan was like a constant combination for a lot of the foods that came out of my paternal grandmother's kitchen um so i as a child uh, didn't like eating the methi itself because bitter but uh, the fragrance of methi is so amazing and uh, <coughs> methi with goes again methi you have the saag the leaves and methi you have the seeds and uh, the methi seeds again a uh, lot of pickles use it you sort of dry roast it and uh, grind it it's sort of uh, in combination with various other uh, spices it works really well 
and then methi by itself is a great way of uh, tempering uh, dals, vegetables. You can make for instance like a loki, okay, gourd, a simple thing like a gourd which is uh, pretty tasteless at times. If you just you know heat a little oil, temper it with methi seeds and a little bit of ginger. Uh, garlic if you eat it you do not need the garlic and just add your uh, loki chopped up in small bits into that add a little salt and uh, turmeric and that is a beautiful dish you have over there you do not need anything else. So and of course uh, a lot of these spices that we have talked about today you can use them singularly you can use them in combinations. And that is the beauty of the Indian cuisine depending on what you are cooking, which uh, vegetable or which meat or which fish or which part of the country you are cooking in. You have all these combinations cropping up, you have these you know different uh, masalas uh, which sort of go into different dishes and each combination gives you a different taste. So next week what we are going to do is we will start with the. Uh, more aromatic stuff and we will start with what is called very rudely the devil's dung or hing uh, as we like to call it or asvatida. Um, methi saying methi is the heart of five spices makes panchpuram in warm kitchens adds wonderful flavor to mango pickles. Yes, methi does that Choiti and uh, panchpuram is such a controversial topic actually because uh, I believe Pachpuron uses Radhuni and a lot of people say no Pachpuron only uses mustard but uh, I do not think that is correct because uh, anyway we shall go into the aromatics in uh, next week's episode where we will we shall start with hing and hing is something that uh, even if you have the most uh, non you know uh, what should I say person who is like total lack of appetite if you choco a little bit of hot ghee with hing uh, and jeera and adrak and the fragrance that flows through your house everybody is hungry yes or no. And so with that should we call it a day and wait for next week when we get into more spices All right. or any questions. No, there are no questions. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing you have to promote the captain's uh, channel. Ah yes. Okay. So two two things that I wanted to mention. Uh, the reason why we did this at four in the evening is because uh, that Ganpati is still going on, and the minute the sunset happens and stuff like that, people start going dum 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 dum. So we wanted to avoid that noise. And the second thing which is most important is that Anoop has started his uh, Life in the Matrix YouTube channel. So if you have not seen it please do go and watch. Um, it is pretty fascinating he is doing all these walks through all these beautiful places and the last one was where he went to Little India in Singapore. And uh, I am hoping he goes back again because I want him to go a little closer to the food. I want to see the food that they are serving there. Uh, Little India of course will be Indian food but uh, I am really interested in the Singapore street food. So captain if you are watching this please please share some Singapore street food with us and if you can talk those ladies if you can charm them into sharing some of their recipes then please do that as well. So with that message name of the channel again. life in a matrix the name of the channel yeah the name of the channel is life in a matrix and I think Amit will post a link below. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. So with that we shall say bye bye and see you all next week where we will be more spicy.